Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the uh, Detroit Public Library. Uh, we have a great author here today. Um, my name is Romy Miner. I'm the curator of the E. Azalea Hackley Collection of African Americans and Performing Arts here at the Detroit Public Library. And this collection was named after Madame Hackley in 1943 by the Detroit Musicians Association. And um, Madame Hackley was a social activist, uh, African American uh, vocalist, singer, a mentor to a lot of up and coming concert artists such as Marian Anderson and Roland Hayes during the early part of the 20th century. And we're gonna learn more about her today. Uh, the author uh, that's gonna go over this extraordinary woman is Dr. Juanita Karf. And she has taught music in grades K through 12 for 10 years before deciding to work on her master's and doctoral degrees. She completed graduate work at the University of Georgia in 1992. And since then, she has taught at Middlebury College and Middlebury, uh, Vermont, Vermont, and at the University of Georgia in Athens, and at Oberlin College in Oberlin, Ohio. Ohio and at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. She presently lives in a log cabin in the beautiful Green Mountains of Vermont. Well, that sounds nice. With her composer husband and three rescue greyhounds. Must be really <laughs> busy. <laughs> in her spare time, she collects maple sap during the early spring and devotes as much time as possible to research and writing. So, Without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Juanita Karp, and she's going to go over Isaiah Hackley's life. And this is from her book, Performing Racial Uplift. Isaiah Hackley, an African American activist in postbellum to pre Harlem era. Dr. Karp. Thank you, Romy. Very, very nice. And welcome, everybody. And I'm very glad you're here. Um, <clears throat> in 1865, only two years before Azalea Hackley was born in Tennessee, the Ku Klux Klan organized its inaugural branch in the central region of the state. Their reign of terror soon reached Murfreesboro, the town where the Smith family resided. Not surprisingly, the Smiths lived in constant fear for their safety, as did all of Murfreesboro's African-Americans. Azalea's mother, Carilla Smith, maintained a small school for freed persons in a local church, a likely target for white supremacists. In 1870, a Klan mob attacked Smith's school, smashing windows, and hurling rocks at the building. The resultant damage forced the closing of her school. Azalea's parents made the hasty and difficult decision to leave Murfreesboro. The family fled to Detroit. Their move must have been challenging as the family not only included three-year-old Zachley, but also her infant sister Marietta, born in 1869. Fortunately, Smith relatives lived in Detroit and they welcomed the displaced family into their home. Once settled in Detroit, Azalea's father, Henry B. Smith, opened a successful curio store. Azalea's mother, an accomplished teacher and singer and pianist, began teaching mu music lessons. Together, they were able to earn a comfortable income for the family. Under her mother's guidance, Azalea began to sing and play the piano and violin at a young age. By the time she entered school, she could already read music. Visitors to the Smith residence could count on a young Azalea's entertaining performances as a singer and pianist. While Azalea was still in high school, her parents divorced. This change in circumstances required her to help with the family's finances. To earn money, she gave music lessons and performed recitals. Her gifts as a pianist and singer were widely sought not only in Michigan, but in neighboring states as well. 
One of the earliest surviving photographs of Azalea shown here was taken during this time period. Uh, Dr. Carr. Yes. Uh, could you hit your slideshow? I'm still seeing the start your actual up there so we can see the. Okay, let's see what we've got. Did that do uh, anything? Yeah, it can play from current slide. Okay. Up in the corner. Uh, let's see. Ah, there. Okay. Did that do it? Yes, it did. Oh, Go so right ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, after high school, Azalea completed the program of study at the Detroit Normal Training School. For those of you unfamiliar what, to what was then referred to as normal training, a program of su such study prepared graduates for a teaching career. Having obtained teaching credentials, Azalea taught in Detroit's public schools for several years. In the late 1880s, Azalea met Edwin Henry Hackley, a successful Colorado lawyer and businessman. Edwin Hackley traveled frequently to Michigan to visit his mother and other family members who resided in the greater Detroit area. The couple maintained a long distance relationship and married in 1894. Since Edwin Hackley was already well connected in Denver, the couple decided to settle there. They established residency in Denver's elite black neighborhood known as Five Points. This area, famous for its cultural amenities, was often referred to as the Harlem of the West. Five Points residents supported the state's best known black newspaper of the day, the Colorado Statesman, founded by Edwin Hackley in 1888. The Hackleys worked together to produce the paper and Azalea wrote a women's column. Around 1896, Azalea Hackley enrolled at the University of Denver. While a student, she contributed, continued to contribute to the couple, couple's income by conducting choral concerts, directing church choirs, and giving music lessons. In 1900, she graduated from the university with a degree in vocal performance and music education. She was the first African-American graduate of the university, a fact that mysteriously went unacknowledged until around 10 years ago. How is it possible that Hackley's race went unnoticed for so long? An explanation offered by the university states that the institution did not keep statistics about the racial identity of its faculty and students in the 1890s, and therefore Hackley did not attract the attention of more recent university historians. Also, this student photograph of Hackley might offer another explanation, as it does not unequivocally reveal her racial heritage. After graduation from the university, Hackley began touring as a soprano soloist. Admission was charged for most of these concerts and she received a proceeds of the gate take. As a performer who now routinely inspired glowing reviews, she cultivated the appearance of an elite and successful concert artist. A photograph from around 1901 shows her fashionable and expensive taste as in this case, an elaborate hat piled high with rib ribbons and exotic feathers. Even as Azalea Hackley experienced considerable sex success in Denver, she also began to suffer from intermittent respiratory illness. She attributed her health problems to Denver's harsh winters and high altitude. The Hackleys also found themselves embroiled in racist unrest that had begun to escalate in Denver. With increasing frequency, many businesses refused service to Blacks. As Edwin Hackley's friend and fellow Black journalist, David Wilborn reported when he visited Denver, I did not find Denver at all what it is cracked up to be and of which I've heard so much about. I am surprised to find so much prejudice. I am forced to say that Denver is the wickedest city I have ever been in. In order to escape racist humiliation and to find relief for Azalea Hackley's respiratory problems, the Hackleys moved to Philadelphia sometime in 1980. After
After settling in Philadelphia, Hackley continued to perform in many cities throughout much of the United States. In addition, she assumed the position of music director at the Black Church of the Crucifixion. With the support of the church's pastor, the respected activist, Reverend Henry Laird Phillips, Hackley organized a large amateur community chorus she called the People's Chorus. She also began to mentor promising young African-American musicians and help them find quality instruction and employment opportunities. She invited a young Marian Anderson, the now legendary contralto, to sing as a soloist with the People's Chorus. Anderson was one of the early beneficiaries of Hackley's rising prominence in the world of performance and concert music. At the time Anderson began singing with the People's Chorus, she was only around six or seven years old. This experience was so significant for Anderson that she reminisced about it de decades later. In her autobiography, An Anderson recalled that Hackley had her stand on a chair during her performances. As Hackley commented, I wanted Marion to feel elevated. I wanted no one in the back of the hall to have the slightest difficulty in seeing her. In her solo recitals, Hackley programmed famous opera arias, popular ballads, virtuosic pieces, and spirituals. For example, newspaper critics raved over her rendition of the opera aria, Thou Brilliant Bird. I'm sure that any of you who are singers can appreciate the vocal flexibility and expressiveness required to perform this work. Amazingly, Hackley often played her own piano accompaniment when she sang this piece. Hackley also thrilled audiences with her rendition of the infamously difficult show piece, Staccata Polka. This excerpt illustrates the stamina and agility this piece demands and also helps to illustrate Hackley's extraordinary vocal capabilities. Unfortunately, the Hackley's marriage began to falter not long after the couple moved to Philadelphia. Most likely, Azalea Hackley's frequent traveling placed considerable strain on the relationship. The couple separated around 1905. After separation, Azalea and Edwin remained friendly and never pursued divorce proceedings. Hackley traveled overseas several times during her career and visited France, England, and Cuba. Not long into the 20th century, she came to the realization that she would benefit from ad additional instruction in singing. However, she also knew that few American institutions offered conservatory level opportunities for black musicians. Without quality advanced training in vocal technique, aspiring black artists could not hope to succeed in the highly competitive world of the predominantly white concert stage. Newspaper notices about European teachers attracted Hackley's attention. She was drawn to one advertisement in particular that mentioned the possibility of studying with tenor Jean de Rezka. A world famous opera star, de Rezka had recently retired from New York's Metropolitan Opera Stage and had opened a teaching studio in his Parisian residence. At the time of his retirement, he was one of the most sought after teachers in the world of singing. Lessons with Dereska offered a potent credential with which singers could boost their careers. However, few singers ever made it into Dereska's studio as he sought only the most talented of vocalists. He selected his students through a rigorous audition process, as he told various journalists. I accept no one who has not talent. I take only pupils as interest to me. My students' voices have to be of exceptional power and promise. There must be something of the mind, the feeling, and the passion in their voices. Clearly, Hackley's musicianship exhibited all the characteristics Dereska desired in an audition, and he selected her to join his studio. She was the first African-American to achieve this honor. 
Dureska's students could look forward to the comforts of his sumptuous Parisian mansion and to vicariously experience his extravagant lifestyle. Dureska's instruction included not only private lessons, but also coaching in opera scenes. These coaching sessions took place in a small theater that he had built as an addition to his mansion. While in Dereska's theater, students often wore operatic attire. A photograph of Hackley taken during her studies with Dereska shows her wearing an elaborate stage costume. Among the press accolades Hackley attracted while in Paris, one journalist in particular wrote that she was captivating all of Paris with her beautiful voice. Another journalist noted, of the many foreign students who have come here to study, perhaps none of them has ever accomplished more than Azalea Hackley. She had been here but a very short time when she won the admiration and esteem of the entire class of Dereska's students. Her unusual sweet and flexible voice, quick conceptions of music, and amiable disposition soon placed her in a position where all voice students looked to her as an authority on how to solve different musical problems. Ackley also traveled to England and spent the better part of 1908-9 in London. While there, she concertized, gave music lessons, and conducted choruses. She became friends with celebrated Anglo-African composer and teacher Samuel Coleridge Taylor and convinced him to accept promising African-American musicians as students. Such an opportunity proved particularly beneficial for Clarence Cameron White, one of Hackley's many protégés. Thanks to Hackley, White was able to study with Coleridge Taylor during a residency in London, and he eventually became a respected composer and concert violinist. Hackley also sought an opportunity to study voice while in London, and she auditioned for William Shakespeare, England's most famous oratorio tenor and a renowned pedagogue of his day. Shakespeare shared with Dereska an interest in teaching only the most gifted singers as private students. In selecting prospective students, Shakespeare chose singers with mature voices whose technique was already highly developed. Hackley's studies with Shakespeare differed considerably from those she experienced with Dereska. Under Shakespeare's guidance, Hackley focused on breathing, diction, and posture, and on solo art songs and oratorio arias. Shakespeare also advocated community music classes and his philosophy regarding music education increasingly influenced Hackley's activities as her career unfolded. While in London, Hackley commissioned famed photographer Argent Archer to take her portrait. It is not known how many images this photographic session produced, but one in particular shown here became quite well known to newspaper readers. Hackley saw to it that this image appeared frequently in advertisements for many of her upcoming events. Not only did portraits assist concert artists with advertising, they were also the hallmark of a successful career. Like many performers, Hackley sometimes distributed autographed portraits at her concerts. During, Hack during the time of Hackley's prominence, African-American activism was referred to as racial uplift. The movement addressed many pressing concerns, including accessibility to quality education and medical care, the right to vote, and the attainment of meaningful employment. Hackley contributed her own unique and influential ideas and strategies to a racial uplift initiatives, especially in the related realms of music performance and music education. Beginning as a young girl, Hackley associated education with activism. As an adult, she readily recalled the significance of her mother's extraordinary efforts to teach freed persons who strove to improve their lives through schooling. However, Hackley's experiences as an elementary school teacher convinced her that most Black Americans could not obtain a basic education of equal quality to those provided for whites. She knew full well the inequities inherent in an educational system 
that woefully underfunded schools in black neighborhoods. Of paramount concern to Hackley, however, most black schools did not and could not afford to offer any instruction in music. Hackley became the foremost authority of music education in black communities during her era. She formulated a unique philosophy of music teaching and employed innovative strategies to encourage African-Americans to regard music as a vital component of racial uplift. She considered blacks as naturally gifted musicians, particularly as singers. Shortly after she graduated from the University of Denver, she began to engage her audiences in music lessons. She referred to each of these lessons as a vocal demonstration. Usually vocal demonstrations comprised a portion of a typical, typical Hackley recital sandwiched in between her song performances. Vocal demonstrations began with audience members standing as Hackley guided all present through elementary breathing exercises and then progressed to essential vocal skills, including diction, intonation, and voice quality. Hackley believed that musical participation not only offered a vibrant mode of cultural expression, it also enhanced individual self-esteem. Additionally, music provided unique opportunities for Blacks to nurture attributes she considered crucial, crucial to the cause of racial uplift. For example, she intended her group music lessons to serve as a vehicle for building race pride and race cohesion. She told her audiences that music yielded many avenues of employment for African-Americans, such as in the entertainment field, as teachers, and as music directors in churches. She also believed that success in the realm of music would raise the overall opinion whites held of Blacks. Hackley also presented vocal demonstrations at hundreds of Black schools throughout the country. Toward the end of her career, she claimed that she had taught in over 500 African-American schools nationwide. Not surprisingly, the press affectionately referred to her as the teacher of 10,000. Hackley was in Paris in July 1914, just prior to the outbreak of the European conflict that erupted into World War I. She wrote letters to African-American newspapers in which she confirmed the ways France was basing for armed conflict. In one letter, she exclaimed, war is in the air. In another letter, she described the main Parisian thoroughfares and how marching troops, war vehicles, Red Cross wagons, and the blast of the bugle created chaos, unrest, and confusion. As war became imminent, Hackley was, not surprisingly, forced to flee Paris, and she arrived back in the United States in September 1914. During the World War I era, Hackley's public events assumed an altogether different configuration and purpose. Beginning in late 1914, she began to produce what she called folk song festivals. These events showcased community choruses under her direction. She usually included vocal demonstrations at these events. Hackley programmed spirituals or what she referred to as folk songs almost exclusively at her festivals. A notable folk song festival took place <clears throat> in Savannah, Georgia's municipal auditorium under her skilled direction. And this event attracted considerable publicity. For this event, Hackley led a large amateur chorus of 250 singers consisting of children and adults. She played the piano accompaniments for all the pieces and simultaneously conducted the chorus. The respected syndicated columnist Jane Judge reviewed this performance. In her review, Judge wrote the following. The chorus under Hackley's hand sang with a purity of tone precision and control that did not lessen the fervor and abandon of the spirituals that were sung. The amazing harmonies which marked so many of these songs were striking and stirring. Hackley's interpretation rendered them more beautiful and ideally nearer to the emotions these old songs express and to the religious spirit from which they sprang. 
Hackley produced innumerable other folk song festivals throughout the country, including a notable event in Detroit's Armory that drew a huge crowd of around 2,500. For this performance, she conducted a large chorus of adult singers and a mixed children's choir. A newspaper critic applauded the astounding results she achieved with amateur singers and added, never in the history of musical life in Detroit was such singing heard. And the fact that all the songs were compositions of members of the race added novelty as well as producing remarkable enthusiasm. As US participation in World War I became inevitable, Patriotic rallies and pageants became all the rage throughout the country. However, in many locations, Blacks were not welcome to attend or participate in patriotic events organized by whites. In response to this level of racism, Hackley designed her own patriotic celebrations and produced these in countless locations. Her wartime programming featured exclusively music written or arranged by Black musicians. She also continued to promote the singing of black spirituals. She believed that spirituals not only expressed African-American resilience and courage, but also represented the spirit of freedom for which the US and its allies fought in Europe. For pageant repertoire, Hackley, Hackley frequently turned to songs by her friend, the celebrated composer, Harry T. Burley. One of five songs Burley wrote, especially for use during World War I, was called The Young Warrior, and Hackley frequently programmed this song. The song's timely lyrics tell of a soldier bidding farewell to his mother. Soldiers in Europe knew this song well, and it remained a favorite with Hackley, Hackley's audiences throughout the war. Hackley, Hackley frequently programmed music written by two other friends, the famous writing team of Bob Cole and James Weldon Johnson. Among these songs, the lyrics of Since You Went Away appeal to those whose loved ones served overseas. With words and dialect poetry, the song featured lively rhythms and timely sentimentality. Crowds at Hackley's events also thoroughly enjoyed another song she regularly programmed entitled it takes a long, tall, brown-skinned boy to make the Kaiser lay his weapons down. The song was actually a wartime arrangement by an unnamed Black lyricist of the hit tune, It Takes a Long, Tall, Brown-Skinned Gal to Make a Preacher Lay His Bible Down. The catchy, swinging, and syncopated rhythms of the song were enormously popular in the US and also overseas. Hackley's audiences enthusiastically sang this song along with performers. Yet another wartime favorite of Hackley's audiences was a song written by Louisiana composer W.J. Nickerson entitled The Colored Soldier Boys of Uncle Sam. Nickerson's song opens with percussive motives and the song's piano accompaniment establishes its characteristic stirring march tempo. At the beginning of the song's refrain, the left hand of the piano part imitates a military drum, pointed out here in this excerpt. Nickerson instructed vocalists to produce a reveille call by making bugle sounds into their hands held up to their lips, probably like do, 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 like that. In this example, the notes of the rev reveille part are located in the very top part of the example in between red brackets. Hackley's audiences joined with the performers in this fun. Some of Hackley's patriotic events included dramatic scenes and symbolic ritual. In keeping with the goals of her activist philosophy, she paid homage to the cultural expressiveness of Blacks and the richness of their African ancestry. Reviews offer us some information about her approach to the more, her more dramatically conceived pageantry, especially her love of spectacle. As one journalist wrote of what Hackley called a queen's pageant, amid the fanfare of trumpets and the emblazoned banners of heraldry, Azalea Hackley gave a spectacular pageant in the spacious and famous Metropolitan AME Church. The sanctuary was richly decorated. 
15 governments were represented by costumed queens and following them in the procession was a lar were a large number of flag bearers. The house rang with cheers as the united throng sang the Star Spangled Banner. The queens of England and France sang God Save the Queen and the Marseillaise, the audience standing throughout. Following the singing, the queens intertwined the stars and stripes with the British Union Jack and the tricolor of France. This thrilling and dramatic scene was followed by a vivid portrayal of queens representing Africa, China, and Japan. Newspapers also drew attention to what they called monster pageants that Hackley produced in Atlanta, Georgia in the city's cavernous auditorium and armory. These events attracted capacity audiences, but with whites and blacks seated on opposite sides of the armory. Hackley's elaborate program featured hundreds of participants and included 100 African American military personnel from nearby Camp Gordon. In her tribute to those fighting overseas, she programmed a procession of countries led by marching soldiers carrying flags. Following the entrance of military personnel, over 500 children dressed in international costumes filed into the auditorium. Everyone in the armory sang patriotic songs. Hackley expressed cautious optimism for the future of the pageant movement that she had introduced to Black communities. As she wrote, it is my hope that pageants may be produced in every city and town in the country by some school, church, or other organization in order that, as never before, the world may recognize not only our worth and advancement, but our determination to be a real part of the best community life wherever we may chance to live. Thanks to her success in popularizing pageantry, Black communities continued to produce pageants during the Harlem Renaissance from the 1920s onward. By 1919, Hackley's health had begun to deteriorate. During a tour in California, she collapsed just before a performance. Her sister, Marietta, traveled to the West Coast and brought her back to her Detroit residence. Once in Detroit, Hackley's condition continued to decline. On December 13th, 1922, she suffered a series of cerebral hemorrhages. Her sister and brother-in-law remained by her side during her final illness. Hackley lapsed into a coma and died several hours later. She was laid to rest in her family's plot in Detroit's historic Elmwood Cemetery. Hackley's approach to activism was unique in her day. Unlike some of her contemporaries, she shunned militant political debates and instead harnessed music as a vehicle for racial uplift. By teaching large audiences the basics of singing, she reached thousands of African-Americans. Black children thoroughly enjoyed her appearances at their schools and her lessons usually offered the only music instruction they could experience. Her pageants and folk song festivals gave blacks an opportunity to express, express patriotism and to do so through celebration of African heritage and unique cultural expression. For all the fame that Hackley had attained during her lifetime, relatively few permanent personal reminiscences of Hackley by people who knew her well have surfaced. Among the recollections I've noticed located, two of her protégés, R. Nathaniel Dett and Carl Rossini Deton, remembered their mentor with considerable admiration and gratitude. Composer R. Nathaniel Dett enjoyed a successful career as the director of music at Hampton Institute. In 1934, Dett offered this fond recollection of Hackley. There is probably no name in America which should be more honored for having stimulated respect for African American music and musicians than that of Azalea Hackley. By going all through the country, especially in the South, and personally organizing mammoth choruses to sing spirituals in the largest available halls before huge audiences. She not only dramatically focused attention on African-American native music ability, 
but also gave Blacks themselves the thrill of pride in their own cultural expression. Owing to Hackley's tireless efforts to preserve spirituals, these songs have become revered concert and teaching repertoire. Several concert artists followed in Hackley's footsteps and regularly included spirituals in their programs. Some of the better known of these singers and activists include tenor Roland Hayes and contralto Marian Anderson, bass baritone Paul Robeson, soprano Dorothy Maynor, and contralto Mahalia Jackson. In another recollection of Hackley, Carl Rossini Deton, at one time an instructor at New York's prestigious Juilliard School, also wrote of his appreciation for his mentor's mission and her guidance. In 1962, Deton wrote to his close friend, the renowned author and activist, W.E.B. Du Bois, <coughs> regarding his profound <coughs> admiration of Hackley. In his letter, Deton emphatically stated, credit rightfully belongs to the musical uplift work of Azalea Hackley for the surge in popularity of black music in the 1920s. Yet Deton lamented that Hackley's approach to musical uplift had yet to be recognized or appreciated by the African-American musical intelligentsia. Hoping to set the record straight and to establish for Hackley a deserved place in US music history, Deton reminded Du Bois of her contributions to racial uplift. Deton wrote, Azalea Hackley was our first musical uplift worker. Our present African-American vocal renaissance is due to the periods of 10 or 15 minutes she used to allot in her concert appearances to training whole audiences to sing. The most lasting and influential memorial to Hackley is, without a doubt, the e. Azalea Hackley Collection. To keep alive the memory of Hackley and her achievements, the All Black Detroit Music Association assembled musical artifacts and presented them in 1943 to the Detroit Public Library. The collection has acquired substantial holdings over the decades and now provides one of the world's richest archival repositories of sheet music and other materials related to African-American artists and musicians. Curators of the collection also sponsor concerts in Hackley's honor of pieces by African-American composers performed by black artists. This effort truly exemplifies the career and accomplishments of Hackley and her dedication to the ideals of musical uplift. Hackley truly deserves to remember, be remembered not only as a teacher of 10,000, but even more significantly as a formidable activist whose influence continued decades after her death. And I hope that this presentation has piqued your curiosity about Azalea Hackley. So to learn more about this amazing woman, activist, musician, and teacher, please read this book. And thank you very much for listening. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Karp. It was, uh, for me, it was, um, uh, after uh, years of being over this collection, uh, it's a lot of things that I needed to to hear. Actually, fill in the gaps of uh, what she what she has what she achieved over her life. So, um, for those still in the audience, um, any questions? Feel free. Heather, I bet I know who this is. Okay. Uh, let me see. Uh, some, some, okay, hold on a second. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, questions in the chat. Do I need to do something from my end? No, you're good. fine. Good. Good. Thank Are you. I hear any any. Chat questions, uh, don't have a mic. Let me see, Heather, just hold on a second. Okay, go right ahead. Trying to get you to talk. Uh, chat. Okay. 
my other talk. Sweet. Because it's a webinar, people might not be able to speak. They have to talk into the, uh, they have to put the questions in the chat. In the chat, yeah. Yes. Um, so if, if they're chatting, then he has to read them, right? Right. I see something. Well, what uh, Cassandra asked, what inspired your, your focus on her? Oh, <laughs> thank you for asking. Actually, it was rather quite by accident. Um, back when I was a graduate student, I had a professor who had been asked to write an essay about Hackley uh, for a collection of essays, and he didn't have time to do it. So he asked me to do it. And I was just blown away by her. I'm My background is in music education, and I was just astounded by how many people she reached and her incredible success uh, as a teacher, her courage as a teacher. I don't know if I could get up in front of 2,000 people and, <laughs> and try to sing. I don't think I could do that. So she just has always astonished us, me, and I've, I've just always been fascinated by her. And it's only been in the last few years that I've been able to gather together all the papers and conference talks that I gave about her and put them into this book. Okay, uh, we have one from uh, Carlton Gulls. Hi, Carlton, how are you doing? Uh, wonderful presentation. He has, has Tennessee acknowledged Hackley or her mother's school that had to be shut down? No, to, to is definitely not about her school. Um, I, which is which is sad, but but then again, um, this is all part. And Carlton would know this. Dr. Goltz would know this. That this is all part of the bigger challenge in working on historical important African American figures who unfortunately have been lost to history, but very much deserve to be a part of our general knowledge today about their contributions to our culture. Okay. Um, another one from Cassandra. Surprises, happy or otherwise? Yes, uh, from your um, research or? Okay, so I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what the question is asking. I'm sorry. It has surprises, happy and otherwise. That's what, what the question was. I don't know if it was um, I don't know if she can elaborate more. Let me see. Uh, besides Marian Anderson, who, uh, besides Mary Anderson, who is her most well-known students then and now? Okay. That's Cassandra follow-up. Right. Okay. For instance, Paul Robeson, definitely. Roland Hayes, definitely. Um, and then uh, the, the gentleman that I, I mentioned, um, Clarence Cameron White. Uh, she not only uh, helped him get into uh, Samuel Coleridge Taylor's studio in London, but she also actually raised money to support him there. Carl Rossini Dieton, same thing. Carl Rossini Dieton got to study in Munich, Germany, once again at Hackley's strong recommendation. Hackley also helped raise money for her him to do this as well. He's one of the first, Hackley was one of the first very important philanthropists uh, in the area of raising money for promising black musicians. Hold on, let me go on. Another question for Cassandra. During research and uh, speaking, what were your biggest surprises, happy and otherwise? So yeah. That's the, part, that's the part I did not answer, I apologize. Okay, uh, okay surprises. Uh, first of all, it can be very, very challenging to work in this area of research, no matter how firm, famous a person might have been during their lifetime. One of the things that was very helpful for me is the fact that certainly in the last um, 15 years or more, there are now a lot of databases online which have uh, newspapers, including African American newspapers. So it, it, it helps to know how to manipulate these databases, how to get a hold of them. The frustrating part of that is the fact that there are a lot of issues that are missing out of these newspapers. They are, there are big gaps there. Um, so it takes some speculation to figure out, so what's really going on here? Also, Hackley 
did not leave behind this tidy little box of letters or diaries or something. Romy would, Romy would absolutely uh, confirm yeah. me. The Hackley collection does not contain those things. So imagine my disappointment no. when she contacted me to <laughs> that out. I'm like, ah, but there are other people that did correspond with her. You have to go digging for them. And when you find those letters, they are treasure troves of information that you get to follow up on. I think the thing that astounded me most was just how many thousands of people she reached. I think that was the most wonderful surprise of the whole process. Okay. Uh, another question for Cassandra. Where in the world are the memorials to her besides the library uh, memorial collection here? Okay. And she says, thanks for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think this is part of the problem. I think that the, the, the memorials for her are beginning to emerge, but only beginning. Um, I, the University of Denver has, as I said, recently acknowledged the fact that she is an, a crucial part of their history, being the first African-American graduate of their institution, and they now are paying a whole lot of attention to that fact. It, that's fantastic. Um, I think that there are other places where I'm hoping we're going to see more attention paid to her. I'm hoping my book is going to generate some interest because I think there's a lot more out there. There's certainly another way to look at the materials that I found and, and reinterpret these in different ways. She was a very complicated, rich person. And I, I just invite people to come on board and take more time with her history. Uh, any more questions uh, for Dr. Carp? Okay, um, thank you. Uh, yes, this is. This has been recorded, Cassandra asked, yes. Oh. This is being recorded. Um, so I think they'll have some uh, snippets, usually they'll have it on our website, uh, Detroit Public Library website uh, of this uh, great presentation. Um, so I want to, if that is it, I want to thank Dr. Karp uh, for um, doing this presentation on um, Isaiah Hackley. I've learned quite a bit myself and to learn more again, you can uh, get her book, Performing Racial Uplift. Uh, you can go to the University Press of Mississippi website. That's a prominent one, or there will be others as well. But uh, 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 Cassandra asked me about upcoming Hackley concerts. Um, yeah, right. Yep. Not this, not this year. I would put that won't be this year. <laughs> um, uh, probably in the future, but yeah, it won't be this year. Um, and um, yeah, and I miss, I miss doing them. So they've been a really uh, great experience. Um, so any other questions for Dr. Karp? Um, there was a comment in the chat from Heather. What an yeah. amazing woman. Thank you for the talk. And Heather's uh, follow up to that was, are there recordings of her? Good question. Oh. He claimed that in 1914, she wrote a letter to W.E.B. Du Bois about this, that she had made wax cylinders during that final trip to Paris in 1914. But when she had to get out of there very quickly, these were lost. We know she was one of the first African-Americans to make recordings in Europe, but they have never been found, unfortunately. Oh. Thank you for asking that. Okay, yeah, sorry about um, uh, that one. Um, but yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. We do get a lot of questions like that. Do people, especially from the era, have any recordings? Right. And a lot, a lot have been lost over the years. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it would have been nice just to hear hear her voice. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> okay, any any other questions? Okay, well, thank you uh, all for coming out today. Uh, and 
you know, uh, look uh, for the Zoom uh, presentation on Isaiah Hackley. Um, and, and thanks. Thank you again, Dr. Carr, for a wonderful presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody out there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Have Bye. a good afternoon, everyone. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Romy and Christine. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, and also I want to add, it will be probably within the week on the library's um, YouTube page. Detroit Public Library has a YouTube page. Oh, good. Okay, great. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Everyone Thanks. have a good afternoon. Everybody have, yep. Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks for setting it up. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.